All right, so while I'm trying to figure out, here is the whiteboard. So, because it's an architectural deep dive, let me introduce myself really quick. My name's Mike. Um, I'm a PM lead on the AKS HCI team, and um, my uh, my team owns the deployment. Um, it owns the um, the general, the, all the base components of Kubernetes and as well as all the first party interactions with our first party teams um, in, in Microsoft who use Kubernetes at the edge. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a quick um, or a, a quite extensive walk down uh, what all the pieces are that Matt just talked about briefly. We're going to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, and let me see if that works. Um, if my pen works, then I could actually draw. OK. So when we start out, as Matt said, we'll have a either an AKS HCI, an Azure Stack HCI cluster or a Windows Server based cluster. And let me make that a little smaller. And we got so I'm going to start out with four nodes. I'll call them very simple node one, two, three, four. You'll have some sort of storage underneath and, and I'm not going to dive into what that's going to be, but that's going to offer things like CSV based storage uh, or, and also a place where we can store all our VHDXs and all the other things that um, that, that, that AKS on HCI uses. And I'm not going to dive into all that basic stuff, but um, on top of that, there's also failover clustering. So we're going to take that. And so those are the basic components that AKS on HCI um, gets built on. So when we go through the first step of deploying the management cluster, a few things happen. Uh, first, what we're going to deploy here is a component called, and I'm going to zoom in so I can write better. That's going to be something like called a node agent, and that goes on each of the physical nodes. That's a component that um, comes as part of AKS HCI as part of the management components. And those node agents, they do things like configure networking, they um, they configure uh, storage for, for the VMs. They instantiate virtual machines and things like that. So how do they get to that stuff? Because when you're deployed, there's nothing there. So we do have the, the big, the great big internet here. And there's a piece out there that's called Secure File Service, SFS. And that's where, where we store all our VHD images, where we store our um, mock components and and we kind of come to mock and, and all these other bits and pieces, the binaries that make up AKS HCI, they're all stored out there um, on that. And there's uh, the PowerShell gallery is out there, which contains all the PowerShell modules that, that both WAC and also our PowerShell deployment um, actually use. So when we do a set AKS HCI config and then call in and then do an install AKS HCI, what happens is we'll, we'll initialize failover clustering and we'll deploy a clustered service. Uh, let me take that out here really quick and make that a little bigger. We'll deploy a clustered service that's called cloud agent. And the cloud agent gets an IP address um, out of the VIP pool and we'll talk about VIP pool a little bit more later. Um, and then that cloud agent actually is our interface um, that, that our management cluster talks to to deploy itself and then other components inside AKS HCI. So when, when that happens, once the cloud agent service is up, you'll find it also in, in, in the cluster manager. It's something like it, it's called CA dash and then has some random numbers and letters after it. Uh, so that kind of identifies that piece. Never delete it because if you delete it, your cluster is done and you'll have to go and, and redeploy. So what happens after this, uh, we'll download the VHD image for the management cluster, and that is um, the um, our, our KVA, our Kubernetes virtual appliance. And that thing gets run in a Mariner VM, which is Mariner Linux.
And it's basically a single node Kubernetes cluster. And that brings in some K8s and a lot of pods, in, including the Arc agent that makes the connection to Azure and things like that. So once that's deployed, um, we have all bits and pieces in place. Uh, and that's our Kubernetes virtual appliance. Kubernetes virtual appliance. And so once we have that, we can actually go and deploy um, a target cluster. This is what Matt showed in the second demo, is where our Windows um, worker nodes come down and, and the worker node images get instantiated, the node pools get instantiated. But the first thing that gets pulled up when there is a, a, a target cluster that gets deployed is a Kubernetes control plane. And that's pretty opaque to the customer. And writing on a laptop screen is really difficult because it always flexes. So that's a Kubernetes control plane for our, for our target cluster. Once that's deployed, it gets our connected to the, um, it connects to Azure and then the Kubernetes clusters are connected. It enables the AD connection all those things get enabled and turned on. And once that's in place, we'll spin up the node pool. And as Matt said, there is a couple of different node pools that we can deploy. So there is Linux node pools. They consist of one, two, N Linux machines. And then there is Windows node pools. Um, they consist of one or more Windows machines. So this is a node pool. And this is a node pool. So now we got all node pools deployed, but one thing is missing. So how do we how do how do we access applications that run on those node pools in pods on those node pools? And for that, Kubernetes uses a, a concept called services. And those services are hosted. Uh, they, those services get ass assigned a virtual IP address. Uh, and for that, we have a load balancer. That's currently is HA proxy. And that get also gets also deployed as part of the control plane deployment. And we'll reassign the complete VIP pool that's specified as part of the um, new AKS HCI cluster network command. That VIP pool is assigned here. And whenever you deploy a Kubernetes service to one of those, those nodes here, so that's a service here, then it gets one IP address out of that VIP pool. And then customers can use that that extra. That's usually an external IP address that's also fronted by, say, an F5 or a big IP or some other external uh, that basically publishes that IP address to the internet. And then we got the internet here, and we got our client out here that accesses the service. And that will go here and goes through the VIP pool through the load balancer and gets redirected to the service and that that service can consist out of multiple applications that run on uh, multiple nodes for high availability and it's all a single IP that gets published. So this is kind of the, 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 the rough or the high level structure how how these things come together in, in, in AKS HCI. Um, so what, now I want to dig into uh, some of those some of those basic components. So let's swipe up here. So I said we have a component called the node agent. And the node agent knows how to talk to storage. So for example, it enables the CSVs for all the for all the VHDs that run on there, for, for all the VMs up there to actually uh, expose um, at CD uh, storage for Kubernetes, to expose storage for the Arc agent and, and other things, as well as uh, provide shared storage for the application that runs in the Kubernetes cluster. It also knows about the physical network. And that's kind of an interesting thing where we integrate with the with the network on on the HCI cluster in a very high level fashion right now as 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 Matt said we're using Calico as the default CNI which is an overlay network uh, in Kubernetes 
But in the future, the node agent will also integrate the Calico network or the Kubernetes network with SDN on, on HCI. And that is something that we are um, actively, actively developing right now and um, is going to be act is actively in development. And then the last thing that this actually talks to is the failover clustering or the VM subsystem, the, the virtual machine subsystem on HCI uh, to create the VMs, associate a network adapter with it, assign an IP, and there's another set of IP addresses which you specify by the, uh, when you create the cluster network, that's the node IPs, and the node IP pool is, is the one that gets associated with each of those uh, um, uh, virtual machines that, that are the container nodes, the container host nodes. So the node agent deals with that. The cloud agent on the fail of a clustering is an interface for the, for the management cluster, and that cloud agent also gets an IP address out of set AKS HCI config. So here we have all those configuration parameters that make deploying AKS HCI really simple and, 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 and really a breeze to do like Matt showed in his demo. So that's all I have in terms of the graphics, and I'm going to switch back to the presentation here and and hope we'll have a good discussion on some of the um, on some of the uh, topics that I just raised. OK. Yeah, um, Mike, do you have more content or, or should we discuss this now? No, let's get let's go into discussion. I wanted to leave a lot of time to to, to answer specific questions. Yes. So because otherwise I we... lose myself in discussing things for three hours and we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, we can discuss up to the uh, hour because then the, the next guys are um, available. So um, if other other have questions, feel free, but I'm interested in the load balance balancer. Um, mm -hmm. Is it one virtual machine or uh, can you have multiple virtual machines and how then would they take the traffic from the outside world? Okay, so this is a really great question. This is a really great question, Karsten. Uh, so it's one virtual machine right now that runs HA proxy. Uh, we do allow you in the, in an upcoming version, will allow you to deploy this highly available. So right now it uses failover clustering. So if that one, load balancer dies, it gets thrown over to it, or when the node dies where it runs on, it gets moved to another node and it comes back up and, and the load balancer continues to work. But in the future, we'll also allow highly available deployments for multiple. But also what we're doing right now is building uh, the, a way to, so you can bring your own load balancer. You don't have to rely on a VM-based one uh, that's HA proxy. You can bring things like Metal LB, for example, uh, that's a Kubernetes-based load balancer that runs in multiple pods distributed across the entire AKS HCI cluster. Mm -hmm. So um, then I got the impression the the KVA. This is uh, this is the first uh, the first step of the of the deployment, right? So this that is, is a, let's say master Kubernetes cluster. It's a management cluster. Yes. Yeah. So it's it. it Actually, now it's it's also in one virtual machine, right? The default deployment is one virtual machine, but you can deploy as many as you want. You just specify that as part of the uh, set AKS HCI config. Okay, but I think it it can't be done in the GUI. It has to be done with uh, with uh, PowerShell. PowerShell then. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Windows Admin Center doesn't allow you to change that right now. Uh, something we're working on though. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so as far as I understand, um, I, I talked with a guy. There is a day zero experience that, that is now in uh, in Windows Admin Center. That's a deployment of all the stuff, right? But uh, if you have to handle it uh, afterwards, if you want to deploy more pods, more VMs for, for the nodes or so on, that's it's all only possible with PowerShell, but you are working, I think, on in Windows Admin Center to also uh, offer this capabilities because the Windows guys, you know, usually love mouses and uh, mm -hmm. and pens and uh, are not usually the command led guys. I know Jaromir would say learn PowerShell and get over it, but still uh, there is some hesitation about only doing <laughs> uh, using uh, PowerShell or uh, something else. 
Right. So yes, Windows Admin Center is actually gaining day two operations, what we call them. Um, yeah. uh, basically with every monthly release, so you now can scale a cluster. Uh, you can create additional load pools. You can scale node pools up and down. Those things are already in the latest Windows Admin Center release. And as we move move to the next release, there's going to be even more day two operations showing up. OK, and uh, you use the cluster. Uh, do you do you use um, the cluster the, the um, to put the worker nodes or the the pod nodes on different uh, different uh, hardware servers? So uh, do you use an anti affinity rules uh, for that? Uh, otherwise, I could imagine uh, that that all the Linux uh, VMs are work are running on the same cluster node and this node has a problem and dies. So the, everything is coming up, of course, but you have some problems. So yeah. do you leverage so that? We are definitely using the failover clustering mechanism to distribute the, the load uh, evenly across all the physical servers. That was an issue with the GA release. Uh, that got fixed. Um, I think in the July. I think a July drop actually fixed that. So we're mm -hmm. now distributing the node pools um, physically across all the physical nodes. Okay. Um, what I'm interested in, I will. I will look to the if there are any questions about this so far, because I think most of the guys uh, didn't expect a whiteboard session. I was also surprised, but I love them. Uh, um, <laughs> no, there's not much here. Um, can you maybe elaborate about the update process? Because uh, you update the Mariner Linux and the components, right. or you 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 offer new versions, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is updated through Windows Update, I assume. Or how is the process there, and okay. how does it work? Okay, that that's an excellent question. Let me jump back to the whiteboard for that, uh, because yeah. I think it's easier to draw that uh, to draw that out. So let me scroll up here. So. Let's assume we have a management cluster. So I'll just draw one square here, or one, one rectangle here for the management cluster. Uh, so that's our KVA. And let's assume this runs Kubernetes version 1.22. And then we'll have a, I'll just say target cluster. And that's on 119.11. Those are the Kubernetes versions, by the way. So when we publish a new version, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have SFS here. And we'll publish a new version, and that version will be Kubernetes, contains Kubernetes 121, 1 and 120, whatever, 5, right? So the first thing that happens when I call the, the update AKS HCI commandlet, what will happen is it will go and grab the latest version and then update the, the KVA. So that's going to be 121.1. So first thing is all the VMs that run KVA, worst case it's one, so you'll have some downtime for day zero and day two operations. But so first this will be updated. It'll spin up a new VM. It'll spin up a new KVA in parallel before the first. So this one's still up, but it's read only at this point. And that's going to be 121. One. And once that's up and running, we'll migrate all the data over. And once the data's migrated over, this one gets deleted. And so now we are running on KVA 121.1. Once that's done, um, the customer can now go and call update AKS HCI cluster and provide the name, whatever, my cluster, right? And this is my cluster here. Yeah. This is one with the control plane you, you specify, right, right? Exactly. So this one runs a control plane, has a bunch of worker nodes. So let's say it has two Windows worker nodes and it has two Linux worker nodes. And the control plane and maybe the uh, the, the the proxy. And this is our control it. plane and yeah. and it also has our HA proxy, right? Which is here. So 
So what's going to happen first is, and when I do the update AKS HCI cluster, again, if I don't specify anything and 119.11 is still supported, then we will just update the operating system, but the Kubernetes version stays the same. Same for HA prox. If there's a newer version, we'll just do the same same rolling update. So we'll bring in a new target cluster with new OS. So that's like OS version one, and this is OS version two for simplicity. So now we have 119.11, but we have version two as the OS. HA proxy was the same version, so it, it stayed untouched. Oops. So HA proxy stays the same, it's untouched. All my applications are still running, right? At mm -hmm. that point. And then it's going to go and update all the worker nodes. So it's going to go for the Windows worker nodes. It spins up a new one. When the update's done, it deletes this one and then basically drains this one. Uh, it drains one node, then it basically uh, blocks it from um, getting new scheduled uh, workloads. And then the new node comes up, all the workloads get scheduled, and it goes through and does each node one after the other. And then once that's done, all the old nodes get destroyed and all the new nodes run and the cluster is now in the newest version of the operating system, but um, with the same Kubernetes version. So the mm -hmm. other thing that you can do, of, of course, is I can, I can also add another pro, uh, parameter here and say, Kubernetes version and specify one, what did we say? 121.1, 121.1. Then the same flow will happen, but in, besides also doing the OS upgrade, we're also going to swap the, the Kubernetes version and update that at the same time. At the, at the same, in the same step, right? In the same step, okay. yes. So uh, as you may know, Windows administrators have a kind of fear about updates. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no Windows, uh, uh, just a theory, there's no Windows up, uh, admin there that has never had a problem with a Windows update. So uh, if this is all fully automated, so if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. what can we do? Or is there a, a, uh, the, the, um, the, the, not the fear, but is there the chance that you uh, end up with a cluster that is not working? How do you prevent that? Because it's just one command and your whole cluster components will uh, will be updated. Yeah. So, so the way the way you prevent that is very much the same as you do it on on a virtual machine based uh, system where your application runs on a VM. You're not blindly auto updating everything, right? As a customer, the customer yeah. runs a test pass, so you'll have a staging cluster or a test node pool that you update first, where your application runs in a test environment, and you'll make sure your app keeps running on the new version before okay. you trigger. The production cluster update, right? It's like Matt checking uh, checking in code into main directly. That's not a good yeah. thing. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the customers we talk to, they all have some processes in place to actually validate before they update production, and that's okay. the important piece here. So you'll basically go, you'll run the update through on your staging servers, you're tested, you're validated if it works, you go and pr put it in production. And over time, the customer is going to get confidence that, oh no, this one didn't break the last 19 times. So maybe with 20, we can actually go directly and and, and trust Microsoft to do the right thing. So from a, if you're, if the, that the container is still the same, right? So your container image will still be the same, at least on Linux. You don't have to rebuild your container image. If you switch Windows main server, uh, Windows main builds, then will become, you'll have to redo your container image before you do the update. Yeah, and, and your you application care, might not launch. Yeah. And you take care that uh, the Azure Stack HCI versions and mm -hmm. storage bases direct 2019. Yeah. Uh, it's tested on that uh, on that uh, environment. Correct. Correct. Yes. I, so we have uh, we have test passes. We have sample applications that some of our um, EAP customers, our, our early adopter program customers, have shared with us, uh, where we are, or some processes and flows that they have, microservices they have, and and we're basically in, in, include those in our pipeline test passes. Okay. So in so, the 
uh, I had a question here that was wasn't answered in the in the last session that Matt did, but I think it's uh, also uh, valid uh, to ask it you. Some uh, some uh, attendee asks uh, if we have now DDA support, so for GPUs uh, mm -hmm. in Azure Stack HCI 21H2. Um, could could it be used potentially in a container or will it break the uh, isolation of a container? Depends. I think it depends. He, so the, the classical Microsoft answer, it depends. Of course. <laughs> you are principal so program it, it manager. Depends so on, it depends on your GPU. Um, it yeah. depends on, on what the card is that you use. So T4s are the most uh most common ones we see right now those are the ones we we are working on supporting and with dda no it's not going to break the isolation of the container but there is some considerations to take into account i would not deploy those in a hostile multi-tenant environment for example yeah, yeah right because it's so for for an internal application that runs some gpu based workload that has no chance of some outsider to come in and, and do something weird with the GPU, I'm fine. Um, the A100s or the A70s, the A40s, those are much um, are much more advanced cards that allow things like GPU slicing and, 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 and sharing a GPU across multiple VMs, for example. And so those will be, once we support those on, on um, HCI, uh, things will become uh, much more much more high fidelity than it is with the T4s right now. Yeah. Then I have another question because AKS uh, uh, um, is not free on Azure Stack HCI or on Storage Basis Direct. You have to pay for the worker nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so we have to have connection to Azure somehow because I think they are they are built through Azure. Is it done by the uh, by the Azure Stack HCI cluster, or is it done by the KVA or something? How? Because when I think of storage bases direct, <clears throat> there is no not the requirement for an Azure connection mm -hmm. per se. So it can't be a component in the Windows Server. It must be something in the container. And some Correct. of the IP addresses have have to communicate with mm -hmm. with Azure, right? Yes, absolutely. So KVA. Through the ARC connection of the KVA, uh, ah. we transmit the billing data. There's a pod, there's a set of pods running in the KVA that do the inventory, uh, that check how much, uh, that basically concatenate how much uh, vCPU is used for worker nodes, and then it reports that uh, at a regular interval. And so, like with with HCI, you'll have to connect to Azure at least once every 30 days. Mm -hmm. So once you run out of 30 days, once you run out, sorry, yeah. once you run out of those 30 days, um, you won't be able to do any day two operations anymore. Okay, so in in Windows Admin Center, there's a question if you want to uh, in, uh, in, include your uh, AKS, um, AKS cluster into Arc, mm -hmm. but then I, I assume the KVA is automatically included in Correct. Arc. Otherwise, you can't yes. do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's only for target clusters you can choose to project them into Azure. The KVA is always connected. Okay. So I'm quite satisfied with, with what I hear um, or, or heard. So other topics you may want to touch on because we have still half an hour to the next sure. session. Uh, sure. And I think I think there's there's a couple of things that are that are really of interest for this for 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 the attendees here. Uh, and then one is uh, what we're working on for uh, the rest of the calendar year, for example. Uh, mm. We do have our public roadmap. Matt had it also on his resource slide what, where, where the roadmap is to be found. But GPU support is one, as I mentioned. So that is currently in private preview with a set of with multiple customers. Um, we're working on a, a deployment guide for the retail industry, for example. That is something we've been asked for by a lot of customers. And so if there is interest from uh, this group or customers you know, then then that would be definitely of interest to, to include those into the discussions we're having right now. Because there's some certain, there's some specific challenges with deploying into uh, a lot of different branch office environments. And so learning about those environments, what they look like, what the requirements of those customers are, uh, is definitely something we want to we want to dive into a lot more. 
Um, another thing we're working on right now is integration of service mesh. I'm not sure how how from your point of view, how far that that is, how how, how value, valuable that's going to be. But we have a lot of US customers asking for service mesh right now. Yeah, I, I must confess, I, I don't really know what service mesh is. I think I heard it, but I have no clue what it really is. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. What sure, is sir. it? And I have then another question for you, but uh, first, first okay. service mesh. What is it? Sure. So service mesh allows you to to connect, interconnect multiple or lots of Kubernetes clusters or containerized services. Okay. So and it allows you to manage those in a in a coherent fashion across multiple clusters. So if you have, say, you have a branch office network, you are uh, Walmart, and you have thousands of stores, and each store runs a Kubernetes cluster all with the same application. You want to apply policies across all those applications. Yeah. You'll use service mesh to do that and expose that application. So that's kind of where service mesh comes into play. And it helps okay. with managing those large networks. Yeah, I may be interested in that because I'm I'm in the moment in a POC with a customer who has some branches. And uh, there's also my next question. I see um, a lot of interest or more interest in the data services on mm -hmm. Kubernetes that are available in Azure. So as far as I as as far as I understand, it's SQL, for example, in a container, mm -hmm. and then uh, Arc managed or so, and we heard about that, and then you get it on AKS on premises. So mm -hmm. the, the first question would be. Um, if a customer needs some kind of high availability for their SQL, they have high available SQL databases now, and they want to, to go to the data services, is there a possibility to, to do high, uh, high availability there? I don't know if Absolutely. that's your your topic of expertise, but uh, it's not. It's not. It's not totally my topic of expertise, but from a from an infrastructure point of view, it is supported. Um, it's slightly different from what it would do in Azure because we don't support regions right now, so you can't have uh, multiple failover regions and things like that. So those things will are coming, but you can deploy high available SQL data, Arc enabled data services on AKS HCI today. And it will somehow uh, keep them apart or so, so not. Yes. OK, OK. And then what you're not getting because you're not supporting stretch cluster yet. So once we support stretch cluster, you get different physical locations. You get all those additional things. But right now it's all assumed in a well connected single location. Yeah. I do have two yep. customers that deploy stretch clusters today with AKS HCI very successfully but they have very high uh, bandwidth, low latency connections between those locations. Yeah, so um, I do. Stretch cluster doesn't really know that they're two, they're like 20 kilometers apart. Yeah, that uh, in, in Germany, it's, it's, it's a country of stretching everything, I got the impression. So <laughs> we have a lot of stretch cluster, even in the mid area of customers. So not only the, the larger ones do that, so even uh, 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 Mittelstand customers is the German word, so mid-sized customers, and um, all the um, all the Azure Stack HCI deployments I basically do are stretch cluster deployments. So, uh, uh, but most of the time they are on one campus, so you have maybe some hundred meters or some hundred feet okay. with, between the the sites. So it's not really five kilometers, ten, okay. fifty, m multiple hundred kilometers. It's really on site. So the latency is not not uh, not uh, high there, mm -hmm. and they uh, they always ask uh, when when we talk about data services, they always ask about stretch cluster. So um, we know that it's not coming or it's not planned this year, but mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, can give us um, an impression uh, how high is it on your list? Uh, do you hear the question for stretch cluster often with AKS? Yes. Or? Is it is it more I'm asking and to other customers? No, it's yeah. actually it's actually a fairly it's a fairly common question, um, yeah. and it has come up frequently, and it's pretty high up on our list of things that we want to tackle in the next semester. Yeah, okay. It would so, be help. Yeah, it would be helpful for you if the same IP addresses are on both sides uh, and so on, something like that. Um, yeah, that helps. Um, it also because we'll have to change our network configuration quite drastically to make it work. 
uh, yeah. with different IP spaces in the in the different locations. But uh, this is something we're looking at. So if you have a set of requirements from different uh, deployments that you're looking at, uh, definitely interested on in hearing about those. Yeah, Mike, uh, I'm I'm also in the AA. A EAP program for Kubernetes, uh, IKS would be cool. Uh, I have one special customer, or maybe the, uh, maybe two, to be mm -hmm. honest, that are very interested in data services on uh, stretched, uh, stretched uh, Azure Stack HCI and with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let's get in touch. Topics. Let's get in touch next week when I'm when I'm back from vacation and and yeah. let's uh, talk about that uh, next week then. No, of course it, it it doesn't. It's not so important that we have to discuss it uh, even next week. So other topics uh, we want to touch because we have still some time. Otherwise, yeah, we have two questions. Um, so there were a couple of questions. I see a bunch of questions that have popped up uh, in in the Teams chat in the QA. Yeah. Uh, so where are they? You go a little bit. Here they started. Ah, okay. When will we see the corresponding Windows admin set to support? <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah, that's not for you, I think. For uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI 21H2 GPU support for KAS ports. Okay, it's it's yes, it's it sort is of for, you. for me, but it's it's also a and 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 HCI question, but it's it's a mix. But yeah, so HCI, I've I've heard I've heard the next Windows admin center update should have it. Yeah, uh, I think we saw it. VMs for VMs on on HCI 21 H2, and then for K8s we are for AKS on HCI we are looking um, either very late this year but most likely early next year. And you so mean uh, you mean not fiscal year? You mean you mean you mean the fiscal year, calendar. not the Microsoft year. Calendar. Yeah. The calendar year. Okay. Yes. So what else do we have? Oops. No, I. So there's, I first have to read them. <laughs> so there's a question of how much free space on CSV should we maintain for the K8's upgrade progress as a percentage. So you should at least have um, from the largest VM size you chose and your largest VM disk you have deployed, you should have at least twice that. So say you're running, uh, your worker nodes run 32 gigs, 16 vCPUs, and you're using um, 128 gig storage disk, then you should have at least 256 gigs there uh, for the upgrade process. Mm. Okay. It will upgrade one cluster after the other, so it is it is definitely, uh, there's no simultaneity there. So if you have 10 clusters you upgrade, you try to start it for all 10, we'll upgrade one after the other, it's not, um parallelized right now yeah you said 10 i i thought there was actually a limitation of four clusters in in a deployment is that not uh, there anymore or, no, or there's, no I... hard, there's no hard limit so um we are the, the things we see mostly are two to five clusters yeah. uh with the average be, being three right now but um we are we are testing from way above that and same with the four node limit, right? We save it's four nodes that's recommended and that's what we're seeing mostly, but we're also seeing uh, an influx of six node clusters right now and mm -hmm. whatever HCI can scale to, you can scale to. It all depends okay. on what, um, what's, the mem what's the hardware limitations you have. It's not like Azure where you have unlimited resources or almost unlimited resources to grow. So. You'll have to be careful when you when you define uh, how much you want to put onto the physical hardware. Yeah, there are some commands about the networking stuff. Some said, and I, I'm not sure uh, what that means. You can use Lisp today to do GRE, the no, GRE uh, overlay or VXLAN overlays to cover the networking issue and. It's natively works in NCP, whatever NCP is VMware, I guess. Yeah, so it's not it's not in it's not in uh, Windows uh, or in Azure Stack HCI. Uh, another one is maybe you could stretch the layer two networking with Azure extended networking between two sites for AKS on stretch cluster. But yeah, there's, how, there's how definitely those are all options. Those are all options, and yeah. and we are definitely looking at uh, what HCI is doing in that space, and then we're we're layering on top of that. 
But keep okay. in mind that Kubernetes always has an overlay in, in our current deployment, AKS Another has overlay. an overlay network that completely ignores the underlying network. So, or or mostly ignores the underlying network. So, so if you now if you now integrate in SDN, the next session is about SDN. Uh, you have still another overlay network in Kubernetes, right? Correct. Correct. <laughs> a much so a lot of overlays. SDN and then SDN is opaque to Kubernetes as the way it's deployed right now. Uh, then it basically sits the 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 VXLAN overlay network sits on top of that. Okay. Cool. Network policy controller. Ah, network policy controller. That's something yeah. uh, Windows has. Okay. Thank you for clarification. So it was not about VMware. Uh, it was NCP was a network policy uh, control. It would be NPC. And, some, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you can use Lisp uh, guy <laughs> does know uh, K8S uh, I think uh, a lot so much more than I do. Other topics we can uh, we can touch because we are out of questions. Okay. Um, so because you spoke about SDN, so there's a there's also an effort going on, and David Schatz going to talk about that, I believe, in the next session, uh, to integrate actually directly with SDN to go away from the overlay network in to allow you to go away from the overlay network in Kubernetes to actually attach directly to SDN your pods. Okay. And so that that's going to be an interesting thing too for customers because it removes a complete layer of networking and makes things much easier. Okay, cool. So um, as far as I understand, we have a uh, Kubernetes is the, the developing fast and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not easy to keep up. Uh, I was surprised. I'm I'm a, I'm a Kubernetes rookie. Would I would say. Uh, I, I can barely use a uh, cube cube cuttle or how it's called. Even there is confusion about the name. Um, but I learned, for example, that Docker doesn't use or Docker is not any more anymore used in Kubernetes. So I, there's something about container D. Uh, so I imagine it's hard for you guys to keep up with all the changes or. Um, it depends what the way you look at. If you look at it, Kubernetes has switched from a six time release, six releases a year to three releases per year now. Oh, that's so they, easy then. They have matured much. They have also matured. There is definitely monthly patch releases for CVEs and other hot fixes. Um, the one, the one thing for the last, the last minor release came out and that removed Docker shim support. Yes. So we're now. Basically, Docker also runs Container D under the covers, but there is a shim on top of it, and that support got got removed from um, uh, from Kubernetes. So we're switching to native Container D now, or we have switched to native Container D. Yeah. Yeah. For the customer, there's no difference. The containers keep running. It's really the container runtime that now is pure Container D and does not talk through that adapter interface that Docker yeah. had before. So I, I I heard something, but I'm not uh, quite sure if it's true. Um, you you skipped the storage part, and that maybe that's not uh, the, your expertise. But there is, I think, in Kubernetes is NFS supported. Is there also SMB supported because it's a Windows thing? Uh, I think in AKS in, in in Azure it's supported, or yes. It, um, all, but SMB all, is is barely used in AKS in the cloud. Um, but it's used heavily, obviously, in 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 AKS on HCI because that's the predominant storage interface we have. But we also yeah. support um, other storage interfaces like Azure Blob Storage or something like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would I would say um, if we don't have any more questions, um, well, not for the container part. I think so. We finished all the questions in the in the Q and A. I think so. Hopefully, we didn't miss anyone. Yeah. So maybe you can look through the Q and A again, Mike, later and answer some questions. And I would oh, say thank you. Yeah. Or do you want to? There's one question that just came in. Um, is KVA a management node and Kubernetes control plane is the master node? Then how to make the control plane HA? So KVA is an is an appliance. It's a single node Kubernetes cluster. So it runs a Kubernetes cluster control Kubernetes control plane inside that VM, and you can make that HA by just specifying you want to run three instances of it uh, in set AKS HCI config. You cannot do that in Windows Admin Center, only works in PowerShell, but then it will deploy three 
uh, of three VMs, for example, or you could deploy five, whatever you you desire. And keep in mind, though, that the more you deploy, the more resources you take away from your HCI cluster, obviously. Um, and running KVA as HA uh, has also has also certain downside if you go beyond three nodes uh, with etcd reliability. Uh, and that's something we're working on for uh, future release next next calendar year to actually improve on that. OK, so it, it is possible. And as far as I know, you don't pay for the management uh, VMs Correct. like the KVA yes. and the control plane and so on. It's only the worker nodes. The that Linux, is correct. Uh, yes, only the, the only the V cores of the worker nodes are are built. Yeah, yes. and and the real cores, not the um, hyperthreaded. I learned if if that's correct. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> okay, so if there are more questions, please type them in the Q and A. And otherwise, Mike is done with his session. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, sorry for uh, taking the session and asking my questions because I'm very curious about uh, the AK AKS stuff and how it's done and I learned I learned more and I have to look at the PowerShell deployment I learned, not at the Windows Admin Center. It's so convenient if you click around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but one more question, if you yes. have a production production uh, container cluster, uh, the IP addresses you provide, how, how large should, you, should they be? So a CNET or so? So it, it, depends, it all depends on how, how, how many worker nodes you want to deploy. So we recommend that uh, on, in the documentation, we have kind of like a formula, quote unquote, how to come up with the right set of IP addresses. But uh, you specify, you need, a, you need an IP address for each worker node in, the, in a node pool. Uh, or in a target cluster, and you need an IP address for each service that you plan to run in that cluster. So, and then you need a, an additional two or three for updating. Right? For updating. So, and also take into account control plane. So, if you're running your control plane HA, you need additional IP addresses for that. So, it say you want to run 15 worker nodes and three control plane nodes. That's 18 nodes. You need 18 IPs plus two for updating and they need at least a VIP pool of three addresses for the API server. You need one, one IP address. You need a second IP address for an update when, when the H on the H, when the HA proxy gets updated. And then the third one will be available for your application service. So but you're saying you're saying you want to run hundreds of service, 100 services, then you need 103, right? So yeah, OK. So, okay. so keep that in mind when you define it, because right now we do not allow you to change it once it's deployed. And you, so, you, uh, you uh, prefer uh, static IP addresses and not DHCP, uh, uh, as far as I understand, or? That is correct. So DHCP is not recommended for production deployments for the simple reason that it's very easy to mix up DHCP scopes across different deployments, and and you can you end up other pieces in the in the infrastructure using up IP addresses you don't want to have used up. Uh, okay, okay. There's another uh, question from Anonymous. That's always great. Uh, is KVA a is KVA a management node and K A K eight Kates K A S K K eight S control plane is the master node. Then how to make the control plane HA? I so understand same the thing when for a target cluster to make the control plane HA, you specify the control plane VM count, uh, and that is uh, a parameter on new AKS HCI cluster, and you just say three, and then it'll deploy three of them. So all in PowerShell, not in WAC, in but PowerShell. maybe we get we get it some sometime in WAC because WAC it, also it will does show up in Windows Admin Center eventually. Right now, it's just in PowerShell. Okay. Yeah, Mike, I, I think uh, I we, we asked all the questions. You could answer everything I wanted to know and also the audience. So thank you so much for jumping in for, for Ben. I, I understand you are in, at holiday as Ben, but you you unfortunately for yourself has internet has internet connection, right? Correct. 